what a blessing it is to hear that voice sing that song again. But more than we miss your voice, we miss your fellowship, Brother Bell. Um, glad your mother's doing better. She's in our thoughts and prayers. And appreciate you, Cass, for um, filling that void when he was gone. You definitely did the song justice, so we appreciate you just as much. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to ask, how many of you guys have kept up with the first two parts of Jonah, the, of this series? All right, so a couple of you. I've enjoyed myself. Can I killed the first two parts? I would have been okay if he would have just said, hey, Tanner, let me get all, all of these parts, and I would have been sitting there back, learning, having a good time. But by God's grace, I'm here right now giving part three, and um, I'm excited, nervously excited, but um, I'm excited to dig in to part three of Jonah, Into the Deep. But before we begin, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne right now as sinners in need of a Savior, as imperfect people who are seeking you. As we dive into this book of Jonah, we ask that you work on our hearts. May your Holy Spirit be in this building and in uh, the homes of everybody watching online. Please soften our hearts, prepare our hearts for whatever you want us to learn here tonight. Help us to fall more in love with you. Help us to see your beautiful scripture in a unique way tonight. Lord, I am an imperfect person, just like Jonah. Please, Lord, despite how much and how often I fall short of your glory. Please, speak in and through me this evening. This is your message, not mine. Work in our hearts tonight. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So, part three of Jonah. So, part one was an introduction where Kenai pretty much went through all of Jonah. Not just Jonah 1, but he went through pretty much the book of Jonah without diving deep into it. But he showed us the structure and all the cool little um, innuendos and things in there, such as, you know, how much of Jonah is in a chiastic structure and how a lot of it um, is uh, kind of reflective of things that happen earlier in the Bible, such as in Genesis. And we learned a lot, and he really set the stage of, uh, for what Jonah was going to be like. And then in part two, he talked about Jonah chapter one. And we see the part where God calls Jonah. We see the part where Jonah basically flees and says, hey, I want to go to Tarshish. And I like how he made the point of, he put a map up, and I don't have the map, but the map pretty much was like, hey, he's right here in Joppa. Instead of going right to Nineveh, which was not nearly as far away, he wanted to go all the way here to Tarshish because he felt like it was safer. And so it was ironic that Jonah, rather than going pretty much probably what we would think of as an easier journey, he was so turned off by Nineveh and the wickedness of Nineveh that he says, hey, I'm going to go all the way across the sea to Tarshish. And so Kenai left off um, at Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And in tonight's message, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about verse, uh, chapter 1 again. We're going to talk about chapter 2, and we're going to go into most of chapter 3 as well. But before we start digging into the meat and potatoes, Kenai told me this week, he said, hey, you have to address the elephant in the room. And I'm like, what do you mean? What elephant in the room? And he said, you're going to have to address the fact that a man was swallowed whole by a fish and then spit out. And so I'm like, okay, I can see where you're coming from there. So for the first two, three minutes, we're going to just look at the logical idea of someone being swallowed whole by a fish and then spit back up. Now, me personally, there's certain people where this is necessary. There's certain people that, and that's okay, that people that want to see, hey, that, doesn't, that just doesn't make logical sense to me. Me, I'm the type of person where I'm like, hey, I've grown up with the Bible, I've seen the Bible as trustworthy, and I can take that it is written for what it is. But there are people who are more skeptical. I'm not one of those people, but there are people that rightfully so are skeptical. So let's talk about just the logical idea of someone being swallowed whole by a fish. Now, I wanted to put a picture up here of a blue whale with a little guy next to it because it really puts into perspective what a blue, how much bigger a blue whale is. And like, uh, what needs to be pointed out is obviously we do not know 
if this was a whale. Um, it says that it was a big fish. And if you look at the original language, it just meant sea creature. So it could have been any sea creature. If you go back to the first one, Jahil. Um, so I wanted to put up a picture of a blue whale because we're familiar with it and show how little and how minuscule people are inside of a blue whale. So it's easy to comprehend and I uh, understand the idea that, hey, this could be, this human being could be swallowed whole by a blue whale. But we're going to look at this. What does this look like to you guys? Just These are teeth, right? What do you think those little two white teeth are? What kind of animal? A great white shark. And so there's been research that's been done, and there's this animal from historic times called the megalodon. And if we look at this, we can see that, hey, there are some ginormous creatures. And based off of finding some teeth of the megalodon, they were able to say, hey, this is how big we think the jaw is. Next slide, Jahil. And this is what they came up with. This is how big they think the jaw of a megalodon would have been. And see, that is more than enough for a human being to go in through without even being chewed up. If you go to the next slide. You guys see the little human being in the bottom left corner? That's the size of a human being. The green is the size of a great white shark. The purple is the size of a whale shark. And the red is the size of what they think an average mag maglodon, megalodon would have been the size of. And the gray is what they think the maximum size of a megalodon could have been. Do you guys not think that that little guy looks like a little pill in the size of, that, of what these creatures could have been? So it's easy to think, hey, this person is quite logical and quite um, uh, logical to think that, hey, someone could have been swallowed by this fish. But more than anything, I want you guys to remember this. Beyond the logic of all this, Jonah 1.17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And for me, that says all we need to know. Yes, there is logical reason why we could believe that someone could be swallowed and somehow not get chewed up, still be sustained in the stomach and uh, spit out. But we see that, hey, Jonah 1.17 says, the Lord prepared the great fish. So this tells us all we need to know, that yes, it could be possible that a human being could be swallowed and shot up out of a, or however, vomited up, I should say, vomited up out of a fish. That is a possibility. But we see that there is something divine, something miraculous in here, that nature is in control by God. And God can use nature to accomplish his purposes rather than the other way around. And so, yes, we can think about the logic of it. Yes, we can think of what the common sense behind someone being eaten and vomited up by this fish may be. But we need to see here that the Lord prepared a great fish. So is there, there is an element of divine, an element of a miracle here. And if we're coming to the book of Jonah not believing in miracles, then what are we even doing here? We're here opening the Bible, and we are here to seek out a God who works miracles. So with that, with that on the table, I want to move on to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2 is largely a prayer. We see, we ended with verse 17 just now that says that the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for uh, three days and three nights. And then this is what happens next. Jonah 2. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, and you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head, and I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth, with its bars, bars closed behind me forever, that you have brought up life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy, holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And that's pretty much the whole of chapter 2. We see Jonah is in 
the stomach of a fish, and he is shouting out and praying to God. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because that's not what I think the point of what we're going to talk about is tonight. But I do want to look at his prayer a little bit because while there, there was probably some sincerity to the prayer, it was very flawed at the same time. Here's four flaws I noticed. A bel- it was belated and forced based on the circumstances. In other words, Jonah was not praying right when he got the call like, Lord, whatever your will is. No, he ran away. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. He had to get down in the sea, and he had to get eaten by a great fish before he finally decided to pray. And so we see that the prayer is more based off of the circumstances, and he has to force himself to pray at that point because that's his last out. We see that there's no confession or admission of wrongdoing. There's no clear request of forgiveness, and he acknowledges that he is in a dangerous situation, but he does not acknowledge what the cause of this situation is. And so, Dan, uh, so Jonah was a very, very flawed human being like we all are. And this is what his prayer looked like in all of chapter 2. And before we move on to what I think the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about tonight is, I want to make, um, I want to look at some of the contrast between the ship and the fish. Because I think there are some stark contrasts. Jonah ran to the ship because he thought this was his form of safety. And then when he was put in, when he got eaten by the belly of the whale, he obviously thought, hey, I am in an unsafe place. I am at a place where I am going to die. And so let's look at the ship in the fish, some contrast. In the ship, Jonah planned to go onto this ship to avoid going to Nineveh. On the contrary, the was prepared by God. The ship cost Jonah money to get on to. The fish was free. On the ship, Jonah voluntarily went down into the ship and he fell asleep. Or the ship, yeah. Whereas the fish, he was involuntary, went down into the fish and into the deep of the water. On the ship, he fell asleep. With the storm going on, he fell asleep. In the fish, he was wide awake. On the ship, he tried to be alone and to be away from the people, but obviously he got waking up out of his sleep. In the fish, I'm sure he wanted some company in that moment, but he was alone. When he was on the ship, he went, when he boarded the ship, he went from the land into the sea. When he was in the fish, the fish took him from the sea and put him on land. In the ship, he went into the storm. The fish delivered him from the storm. Because if you guys remember, when he fell off, the storm and the raging storm stopped. The ship seemed desirable, but the fish seemed very undesirable. The ship was taking Jonah away from God's commission, but the fish towards God's commission. And lastly, the ship was taking Jonah from God's presence, whereas the fish was taking him to God. And so there's a stark difference here, because in Jonah's mind, he was trying to flee Nineveh because he thought that was the dangerous, wicked thing to do. And so he went as, was trying to go as far away as he could to Tarshish. And in this seemingly safe place is where he was mo- the most unsafe. Whereas he was tossed into the fish, the, uh, you remember, the mariners, the uh, Jonah, they... He was caught, cast into a raging sea during a raging storm. And so that seemed like an unsafe place. But because God was delivering him, this was the safe place. It was taking him toward where God wanted him to go. So we see that when he is in the deep of the sea, he prays to God, and this is the situation he is in. I want to talk about Jonah being in the belly of the great fish. Our scripture reading read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said uh, to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. 
So it says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Isn't an evil and adulterous generation is a bad thing. And it says, an evil and adulterous generation is who seeks after a sign. And it says, no sign will be given but this one sign. And so, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there will be only one sign given to them. And that is that of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Many times when we've been here, we've talked about types of Christ in the Bible. Now, Jonah was a very flawed human being, but we see here in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 38, at uh, verse 38 or 39, that Jonah, by Jesus' own words, is basically a type of Christ. Because as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so would Jesus be in the heart of the earth. In sign that would be given to the evil and adulterous generation would be that of the prophet Jonah. But then continuing, it says, The men of Nineveh, Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. And then there's a connection made. Not only does he talk about the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah, but he talks about this other story. He says, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came in from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. How many of you guys know who the queen of the south is? Shout it at me. Queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba. And where was the queen of Sheba going? See Solomon. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's go and look at the book of Jonah. But I'm here to say today that these two stories being put together by Jesus were no mistake. We're going to go look at Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And remember in this story, Jonah is a type of Christ. Just like we talked about in Ruth, Boaz was a type of Christ. Throughout the Bible, we see these characters, and these characters are representing Christ in these stories. And while Jonah was a flawed individual, nonetheless, Jesus said he, uh, that basically said, hey, just as, I was, uh, just as he was in the belly of the fish, I will be in the heart of the earth. And so by Jesus' word, Jonah represents him. Chapter 1 and 2, uh, verses 1 and 2 of Jonah say, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So guys, tell me a little about, about Nineveh. What do you guys know? What do you guys know about Nineveh? It was wicked. It's a pretty bad place, right? We could probably even say, based on Jonah's reaction, that he'd go all the way to Tarshish rather than going with God to Nineveh, that this place was so wicked that we could call it probably an evil and adulterous place, right? An evil and adulterous generation. But what did God how did God feel about Nineveh? He loved it, right? How do we know he loved it? Because he sent Jonah. He says, arise, go to Nineveh, this wicked place. I'm going to send you there so that way you can save them. So we know what happens after that. He says, nope, I'm going to Tarshish. He goes down into Joppa, goes into the ship. The storm happens. There's a raging storm. And when this raging storm happened, they basically said, why is this happening? And Jonah said, Basically, it's because of me. And so, push comes to shove, and what happens is Jonah is thrown into the sea. Jonah 1, verse 15 says, So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And when they threw him into the sea, the sea ceased from raging. When they threw him into the sea, the sea ceased, ceased from raging. How many of you guys have raging storms in your life? Have raging seas in your life. Jesus dying, being buried, and being resurrected will cease the raging seas and the raging storms in your life. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what brings us peace, 
what gives us rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Psalms 107, 28 through 30, then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that it waves, his waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet, so he guides them to their desired haven. We are all going through different raging storms in our life. But the one thing that will stop those storms from raging is Jesus dying, being buried, and being resurrected. And so Jonah is in the midst of this trial, and in the midst of this uh, raging sea in his own life, he thinks that, hey, I am in this fish right now. I'm going to die probably. And in reality, we know that we saw, hey, the ship looked safe, but it was unsafe. The fish looks unsafe, but it was safe. And so often we are in raging storms in our life. And whatever those raging storms may be, we must understand that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gives purpose to those raging storms. And I want to come back at the end, maybe after we, before we pray, and talk about more about Jonah being in the whale, or being in the great fish, whatever it may be. But we see at the end of chapter 2, it says, so the, Lord spoke, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah on to the dry land. So he, was, he uh, went from Joppa on a boat toward Tarshish. He, got in, he uh, went down into the boat, went down into the sea. The fish ate him and took him down into the depth of the sea. He was at the lowest of his lows. And so as he, by his own actions, was taking himself lower, taking himself lower, taking himself to his lower, lowest point, when it seems as if Jesus has given up on him, Jesus takes him exactly to where he needs to be. And he vomits him up onto dry land. And so after this experience, Jonah comes to his senses a little bit and said, and go to Nineveh. Chapter 3 starts out, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <coughs> Jonah had a pretty rough three days. Can we all agree with that? Jonah had a treacherous journey and a treacherous three days. But that three days took him to Nineveh. If Jonah is a type of Christ, who are the people of Nineveh? We are the people of Nineveh. And so Jonah just had this crazy three days and treacherous three days, and it took him on a journey to Nineveh. Jesus had a pretty rough three days. On the third day, he was resurrected. But guess what? He was willing to go through those three days to get to us, to get to Nineveh. Just like Jonah took that treacherous journey after he had that experience with God and got to Nineveh. And then what happened when Jonah came rising out of the sea? He goes to Nineveh and it says what? Then he cried out, and yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Does that scene look familiar? Does that scene look familiar to you guys? He rose out of the scene and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jesus came up out of the grave and spent 40 days with his people. And so, Jonah had this treacherous journey to get to Nineveh. Jesus had this treacherous three-day journey to come to save us and to be with us. What happens next in the story of Jonah? So the people of Jonah believed God, proclaimed a fast, and then put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sackcloth and sat 
in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger that, anger that we may not perish? How wicked was Nineveh? An evil and adulterous city. We talked about how the wickedness of, uh, with, of Nineveh caused Jonah to take the long way all the way across to get as far away as he can. This is how wicked the city was. Are we to believe that a man randomly coming in and saying, hey, repent or this will be destroyed, will get a, such a wicked city to turn around so quick? Why do you think they were able to turn around so quick? I believe it has something to do with the news of what happened to Jonah got back to the city. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was the mariners, perhaps in the raging storm when they were leaving Joppa, in the raging storm they got turned back and God said, oh, you need to go to Nineveh to accomplish a purpose. I don't know what that may be. But Jonah, the news of Jonah being tossed into the depths of the sea, seemingly dead, Anybody getting thrown to a sea like that and then being eaten by a fish is dead meat. The news of that made them want to repent and listen to this man. Just like Jesus dying, being buried, and resurrected is what leads us to repent. And often when it clicks in our moments, it is in a flip, uh, snap of a finger, just like it was with the people of Nineveh. And so the people of Nineveh repent as a result of Jonah's experience and how he shared that experience. Matthew 12, 41, let's go back to where we started at the beginning. The men of Nineveh will rise up with judgment, his judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So we already talked about who are the people of Nineveh. We are the people of Nineveh. And so what does it mean they will rise up in judgment? What does it mean they will rise up in judgment? They will rise. They will rise up in judgment. The resurrection. They will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. When Jesus was talking to these people, who was the evil and uh, adulterous generation that he was talking about? He was talking about the people in that time. How many of you guys agree that we are currently living in an evil and adulterous generation? This evil and adulterous generation of Nineveh, it says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the resurrection, and because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, uh, they will condemn it. And so these people, they were so wicked that jo uh, Jonah didn't want anything to do with them. He wanted to flee as far as he could away from them. And yet these are the people who will rise up in the judgment. These are the people who repented at the preaching of Jonah. These are the people who in the last eight days, despite being at a place where they once could not even discern their right from their left because of how lost they were, because they have found Jesus, they have to share. Because they repented at Jesus' death, burial, and res uh, resurrection, they have a message. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment, despite how wicked they were. Have any of you guys ever looked in the mirror 
and thought, I'm unfixable. I am so wicked. God doesn't want anything to do with me. Kind of the way Jonah looked at Nineveh. Have many of you guys looked at yourself like that? Well, Jesus loved them so much, despite how evil, how evil and wicked they were acting, he loved them so much that he sent Jonah to go save them. And now we're seeing that, yes, these people, they repented of the preaching of Jonah, and now they will rise up in the judgment. And so, these people of Nineveh, as they learned of, uh, learned of God and they repented, would you guys agree that they became more wise? Would you guys agree that they became more wise? Do you believe that when you first... Well, actually, let me ask you this. How many of you guys did not grow up in a Christian setting? Are there anybody out there? There are people... Okay. When you came to know Christ and to learn of Christ, do you believe that you guys became more wise? And so these people became more wise. But we all talked about, we go through these raging storms in life, we go through these raging seas, and there are still things that we do not understand. There are still things we see around us that we're like, why is this happening? Why is that happening? There's still something lacking in our wisdom. I want to go to the next verse, chapter 40, uh, verse 42. The queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. We talked about Jonah, type of Christ. Jesus is saying it. So here, Solomon, is he a type of Christ? So let's go back to Solomon's time and see what we're talking about here. Do any of you guys know? What, uh, tell me something about Solomon. What, what, what was something that he did during his lifetime? He was a wise man, yes. But he got to build something, right? David, uh, his dad, had too much blood on his hands, so he was unable to build the house of God, to build the temple. And so God said, hey, Solomon will be the one to prepare this place. Solomon will be the one to prepare this place. And there's something else about Solomon. You said he's a wise man. Um, what did he ask for? Wisdom to judge. And so, two things to know about Solomon. He prepared the place of the Lord, and he was given wisdom to judge. So he was building the temple of God, and he says in chapter 8, verse 16 of Second Chronicles, Now all the work of Solomon was well ordered from the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until it was finished, so the house of the Lord was completed. And so, he was preparing this place, and it came to a point where it was finished. And so then, what does it say? We're going down like two verses more, and it's going to take us into chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. Did it get put in the slide, Jaheel? Chapter 9, okay, it did. All right. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions. And then it went down. When she gets to her, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. And when it comes time that the uh, place will be finished for us, we are going to go oh, be able to go and ask Jesus all the hard questions that we did not understand on this earth. Why? Why did a hurricane Ian have to come through and hurt all these people? Why did you allow that to happen? Why was I born with all these defects? Why am I going through these relationship issues? Why did my child have to die? Why did I have to get in that car accident on this day? Why was this dude elected president? All the things that we see in this world that are causing us 
uneasiness and we just cannot understand, we are going to have the chance to sit face to face with Jesus and ask him. He wants, he's going to, he, he's, go, he's, ugh, he's currently preparing a place for us. And when it is finished, as the Queen of Sheba, she was able to ask him all the questions in her heart. Verses 2 through 6, it says, So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing, nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe you their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half of your, the greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. And so just like Jonah rising up out of the deep and preaching to Nineveh and being in the belly of the fish for three days, he was able to, uh, Nineveh was able to repent. Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected on the third day, and that testified of his love for us, and we, as a result, repented. And as we repented, we became, we became more wise. But we are still on this journey of life, just like Jonah was in the fish. We were in this journey of life where we are in these raging storms. We are in this position where we do not understand what's going on. But we keep the faith in God, but we still do not understand what's going on. And God is currently preparing a place for us, and there is going to be a day when we are able to stand face to face with him and ask him all the questions that we had. The Queen of Sheba's journey was not an easy journey. She didn't live right near Solomon. There was a journey to get there. The journey we are facing in our lives is not an easy journey. We go through raging storms. We might find ourselves in the belly of a fish, wondering, how did we get here? Why did we get here? And little do we know that it's because we are running away from what God wants. And God is willing to allow a storm to happen in our life if it's going to take us back to the place where he wants us to be. And if we are going away from God's calling and he allows a storm to take us back to his calling, maybe we're not Jonah in this story. Maybe we are the Ninevites. Maybe we are the ones who are living in wickedness. And little do we know that while we are do, living and doing this wicked stuff, there is something going on in the sea even that God is doing to work out our salvation. The people of Nineveh had no idea what Jonah was going through. The people of Nineveh had no idea that there was this prophet in a fish that was about to get vomited up and come preach. They had no clue. But Jonah was going through that storm for the salvation of the people of Nineveh. So whether we are the ones going away through, going away from God's calling in our life, and he has to send a storm to tend us back to where we need to be for the salvation of others, or whether we are the ones who are living in wickedness and we don't even realize that God is putting things into place with other people and other events in order for our salvation to be worked out. All these things are storms that we will not even pro probably even see how all the dominoes line up until we get to heaven. The Queen of Sheba had a journey. The journey was not easy. But when she got there and she was able to stand with Solomon face to face, not even half of his wisdom did she know about. We think we've learned about Jesus. We think we've learned about his love. We do not know the least. And if there are questions that you have for God, if there are questions of why is this happening to me, why am I always going through these seasons of life? I don't understand. Stick it out with Jesus. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected to draw you to him. The journey's not over, though. He's preparing a place for us right now, just like Solomon was preparing the temple. Jesus's, Jesus's, or actually, let me say this. Jonah's journey to Nineveh 
allows, allowed for the Queen of Sheba to go to Solomon. Someone translate that for me. Jesus' journey to this earth allowed for us to make the journey to the new Jerusalem. I don't know what storm you're going through. I don't know what raging sea you're in. I don't know if there's you're in a season where you're in the belly of a fish, not understanding why. But trust that one day when you get to see Jesus face to face, your questions will be answered. And the storm you are going through right now may be God allowing you to go through it for the sake of your salvation or for the sake of the salvation of someone else. Great is his faithfulness. No matter what raging storm we are in in life, we can take peace in the fact that his faithfulness to us is great. We are a wicked and adulterous generation. But God's love for us and his faithfulness for us never fails. And even when we see the beauty of the fact that the God of the universe made his journey down to this earth so that way we could make the journey up to the new Jerusalem, some things still don't add up. Why am I going through this trial? Why am I going through these temptations? This world can often feel like there is no hope left. We all go through different struggles. Emotional struggles, spiritual struggles, physical struggles, mental struggles. But God is faithful. Just like Jonah being in the belly of a fish was God orchestrating the salvation of the people of Nineveh. Trust that whatever storm you're in, if you remain faithful to Jesus, you will one day know why you were in that trial. And perhaps you will even see how God used that trial to orchestrate your salvation or and or the salvation of others. So my appeal is simple tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you are burdened by the trials of this world and by the pain and suffering and sadness of this world, Today is the day to commit yourself to the one who made this journey to the earth for us. Today is the day to say, hey, I see that your faithfulness to us is great. And the idea of a God coming from up his heaven, coming from up from heaven to this wicked and adulterous earth for my sake. That idea is mind-blowing in itself, and I can see how much you love me. I encourage each and every one of you, each and every day, no matter what storm you're in, commit to beholding Jesus. Commit to falling in love with Jesus. Commit to going back to that point where you were in your life at your lowest of lows, and you saw his love and you repented. And trust that although the journey is rough, just like the Queen of Sheba's journey was rough, that if we cling to Jesus one day, because of his journey down to this earth, that we are able to have a journey to the new Jerusalem. If you want to commit today to weathering the storm with Jesus, to seeking Jesus every day, to remembering the journey 
Jesus made to this planet for us every day so that way we can one day make that journey to the new Jerusalem where we can see everything that God has orchestrated on our behalf. If you want to make that commitment today, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are all sinners. Whether we are now or we were, we always, we at one point all were part of a wicked and adulterous generation. But yet you said, I love that generation. I love that those wicked and adulterous people. I don't love the wickedness. I don't love the adultery, but I love those wicked people and those adulterous people. I'm willing to make that journey, that treacherous journey, those go through those treacherous three days for those people. So for that, we thank you. Lord, we have accepted you, in your, accepted you into our lives and we've seen the beauty of your character and how much you love us. But we all still have questions. We go through pain, we go through suffering, we go through sadness in this life. We go through so many different storms that we don't understand how we are even going to live through them. But you have promised us that if we weather this storm, with you that we will one day see why all these things had to be allowed help us to remember that we are safer in the storms of life with you than we are in our cushy household with all we could ever ask or dream of without you Whatever storms life throws our way, whatever storms the adversary throws our way, we commit to remembering that journey you came down, that journey you made down to this earth for us. So that way one day we can journey to that new Jerusalem and look you face to face and commune with you. We don't deserve that opportunity, Lord. But that's the opportunity you've given us. We thank you that you are preparing a place for us at this moment. Help us to weather the storm each and every day so that way we can get there. We love you. We thank you. In whatever storm we each as individuals or we as a church face next, help us to realize that through that storm, you have a plan, you have a purpose, and no matter what situations the adversary creates. He can take those ugly situations, those painful situations, and reorchestrate them for the sake of our salvation and the salvation of others. We love you and we thank you. 